<laughs> Just remember, the yellow-throated warbler will never be on the ground. <laughs> Unlike that, okay, fair point. <laughs> Don't get me started again. This is, that turned out bad. So, no, he said this was good. So I just want to say that um, we've got a pretty full evening this evening. You're in for a treat. And the first person coming up is one who wears many hats. And I admire her so much for her many talents and her wherewithal to just do it and do it well. Um, representing Zeiss Optics, many of you have seen her this evening, looked at some optics, maybe bought some optics. Who knows? Don Hewitt. <laughs> You were, uh, perhaps you were under the impression that I was here working for Birdwatcher's Digest, as I was in years past. Uh, that's not the case. Um, I am here representing Zeiss Optics, who sponsored the checklist that you're all using, I hope. Uh, and um, I, I don't really work for Zeiss. I'm a freelancer. Um, but they sent me a trunk load of their optics ranging in price from $350 to $2,900, and they're giving a discount of at least 10% on just about everything. But I can't sell anything to you. I, I'm not a salesperson. I can just ask you, why don't you try this binocular? Show me your, your driver's license. I'll take a picture of it. Borrow the best optics in the world to take birding tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day. And that's brownie points for me. And then I'll tell you how you can go back get, to get a discount from focuscamera.com. And, and that's all. So show Zeiss some love for their sponsorship by just trying their optics. That's it, OK? Um, thank you. Now, I said I'm not here for BWD Magazine, which is the reincarnation of Birdwatcher's Digest. And that was a really a little bit of a lie, because let me do a little bit of a strip teasing. I am thrilled, and I mean to tell you thrilled, to be uh, the managing editor for Birdwatcher's Digest, along with Julie Zikafus, who, who is the consulting editor, advisory editor for BWD Magazine. <laughs> We would die without her. We would. No, you wouldn't. No, we wouldn't. And the editor of BWD Magazine, <laughs> Jessica Vaughn. <laughs> Jessica, take it away. Oh. This is your show. Oh. <laughs> These are literally my two right hands. Yeah, for okay. And, I, and we couldn't be doing this with, it's, it's, this is editorial magic right here. So we are the editorial team. We are. <laughs> and, and many of you. <laughs> so we were here last year to introduce and, and announce the reincarnation of Birdwatcher's Digest as BWD and you helped us get the momentum going that we needed and it's been an incredible year and we are celebrating our first full volume so six issues are in the books and we have several of them here and if you're missing any of the early issues these three, six issues we have copies and we're happy to share them with you this was the first one with art, art, art by art. Julie Zikafu on the Yes. And our tricolored was our second. This and is by Alex Warnick, up and coming, incredible painter. Yeah, follow her. Woman. Yeah, follow her on Instagram. Her art is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Tell them about Larry. And then this is, I consider the dean of North American bird artists. This is Larry McQueen from Eugene, Oregon. And you may have seen his field guide to birds of Peru. He did the, a lot of the plates for that. but incredible painter and he's so thrilled he's like can i pay you to put my paintings on the cover of pwd and i was like no we will pay you we will pay you yeah i love this yeah. man and so we're um thrilled and this is the current issue current issue yeah. 
So if you subscribe right now, this will land in your mailbox. Yes, and this is art by Dan Derbyshire. 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 Uh -huh. He is an Ontario-based artist. His wife, Seabrook Lecky, wrote the cover article. She was um, the moth guide woman. Yeah. He half wrote the moth they're, guide. They're awesome. So yeah. we were just so taken with this cover, and we really are trying to aim for covers that tell stories yeah. and then find writers that will tell those stories. And often it's been the artists themselves. We've been really thrilled with the caliber of writing. Um, yeah. So this is just the beginning. If you're not a subscriber, we highly encourage you to check us out yeah, and yeah. support us. And the way to subscribe is just to go to bwdmagazine.com. We don't have flyers. We don't have cards that fall out. We just have the, it's, everything's magazine. online, very sleek, very modern, yeah. and um, it's working pretty well for us, I yeah. think. Yeah. I think it is, too. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people said, don't, don't increase the size, don't make it full size, and now that it's full size, everyone says, we love the full <laughs> size. <laughs> now, uh, and I'll just say that Julie Zikafus has at least one column, uh, sometimes more stories and articles and stuff in every issue. She's taken a much bigger role in this magazine than she yeah. did in BWD. Um, and uh, Jim McCormick is a frequent Yay. contributor to And I'll tell you, I'll give you Mark Marlin. Mark Marlin. Yeah, I was just because I was looking. Katie Fallon has uh, an article called Keith Richardson made his publishing Fallon. debut. Hi. If you haven't read it. Yeah. Um, so is this yeah. like local or what? Jeff and yeah. Jeff Sowers. Yeah. Yeah. So we we have first class writers, first class photographers, first class artists. Yeah. It's right. your one stop it's shop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a stack of these over here on this bookshelf. If you there he is. There he is. Yeah. Birders question. Birders mark. question Isn't mark. That a great name. Yeah. yeah. And Curtis Lowe is often featured in photos. Yeah. I, yes. I try to get my dog in the magazine at least once a year. So, uh, so if you aren't familiar with it, if you don't subscribe, or if you do and you want an extra copy, we've got some over here that you can pick up. Thank you. Me? 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 Okay. Me? Hi. That? All right, published poet. Now, don't say anything here. Are there any groupies outside watching this presentation? <laughs> one of us came inside. <laughs> These are people who have been with me to Costa Rica, and I love them dearly. It's just, just amazing. Okay, so we had a lot of fun on Monday night. I read my Birder Cat poem, and I it, I was touched that people said that they enjoyed it and thought it was funny, that's what it was supposed to be. Um, but to remind you that the book is called Don Songs, and it's co-edited by Jamie K. Reeser and Drew Lanham. And the pro, all the proceeds from this go not to the writers that contributed, but rather to the American Bird Conservancy's Conservation and Justice Fellowship Program, which is designed to involve uh, under-involved students in natural history and birding and other aspects of the real world that they might not otherwise be in contact with. So I was proud after I wrote that first one, Birder Cat, and I sent it in and they said, well, why don't you write another one? I said, okay, but, but it has to be a prose poem. I said, well, what's a prose poem? And that sounds like a contradiction to me. So I got educated when they say a prose poem is simply prose written using poetic techniques like alliteration and consonants and sentence fragments and all those other things that poets use to attract attention. So I tried my hand at it and this one is called, and this will be a little bit reminiscent of something else, 
the truth about ruby throats. <laughs> and in fact, my talk last night was a direct outgrowth of my having written this poem. Okay, so as I go through this, kind of think about stuff I said last night and what's in the poem. So here we go. I'm a little nervous about this one because it's a prose poem, and I, I will do what I can. So, okay. <clears throat> the truth about ruby throats. Blurred wings humming, heart fast thrumming, a 20-carat emerald darts through dappled leaves. Green back, white throat and breast, a female hummingbird. Watch closely. Closer still. She's snatching gnats and skeeters, protein to make big pecks and power wings, all while probing blooms for, blooms for sweetness and for energy, burned up by more probing, more snatching. Her crop held slurry serves as food for half naked hummerlings with gaping maws in a nest so small that it seems like a bump on a limb. Adroitly built of spider silk adorned with gray-green lichens, a bassinet for two. From nest edge, mother coughs up brunch for twittering mouse, then ventures out to search for lunch. Another gemstone flashes past. This one a ruby jewel with gorget so bright it stuns until the male turns left and all goes black. An iridescent stunt more marvelous than magic sleights of hand, technicolor trickery to woo a mate but hide with ease from rival eyes. The male perches, not guarding nests and progeny, but set to drive out other males who, wa who want his flower bounty. Then zip, he's after one more female for his harem. A frantic chase and high dive prove his worth, his stamina, his genes. A quick cloacal kiss, his job is done till that next emerald saunters by. Summer lazes on as hummer chicks built of bugs and sugar grow, then bail from home, flight worthy, soon to learn what's good and tasty. But days grow short, trigger, triggering a journey south toward warmer climes where insects buzz and plants still blossom. A thousand miles or 1500, sans map and GPS. For fledglings, a route never flown, but so deeply felt they end up where they're going. For old hummers, a return to winter range. Flying the gulf at wave top height, or in the curl most make it through the, but many don't. Lost to wrong way wind, or running out of gas, hors d'oeuvres for barracuda. Survivors, feathered expats, frolic in the balm, ticos and ticas for a time, snatching at their leisure on fruit flies and whatever sweetness erupts, a Costa Rican paradise for half the year. The calendar advances. March days pass in Guanacaste Hills until the equinox. It's spring back home in Carolina. Eat fast, fatten up, head due north. 20 hours skimming waves again, nonstop. Four million heartbeats, wing beats a million more. Impossible they do it. With pea-sized brains so keen they end up where they started. Same town, same yard, same tree, same feeder, same as six months prior. Impossible indeed. And so it goes. Year to year, one by one, to and fro, a pilgrimage of ruby throats toward neotropic sites and back again to us. Are they ours or theirs? Across two continents, these hummingbirds we share, but do we care? We'd better on both ends of the route. Emerald and ruby, I'd hate to lose those family jewels. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, I have the honor of introducing the evening speaker. Um, I've known Katie Fallon for a long time, and Katie's from uh, the general Morgantown area, Cheat Lake, people call it. And um, she is a queen of the internet. She posts constantly, <laughs> mainly pictures of horses and her three precious, gorgeous, intelligent da daughters. I mean, those girls are something else. And they get it from their mother. Because <laughs> Jesse's a real quiet guy, the husband. And he kind of fades into the distance whenever Katie's out there. 
And Jesse runs a center you're, you're going to hear about tonight more, um, but he's a veterinarian and they do a lot of rehab work and Katie's intricately involved in all that. And she's a well-known author. Her two best books are about very dissimilar birds, cerulean warblers and, and vultures, and vultures. You know, you wouldn't think that vultures and cerulean wars, warblers would be what you think about in a bird expert, but I have to tell you a little story about cerulean warblers that involves Julie and me. Did I say Julie? Yeah. Katie, why? <laughs> Julie, you just filled my mind here. So Kate, <laughs> Katie, Katie, Katie and I um, were out here one day, and I had a net up on the hillside, and we could hear a cerulean warbler singing. And so I got, I think it was Jim Rapp, to run out and put on the ground underneath my mist net a tape recording of the song of the cerulean warbler in the hopes we could track this bird, come down and hit the net. Meanwhile, Mark Garland was out wandering around the property at some point, and he said, I think I hear a couple of cerulean warblers out there competing with each other. So I'm going to take a tape up, and I'm going to put it underneath the net. <laughs> and so he walks up, puts it underneath the net, and wham, the cerulean warbler hits the net. And so he brings it down to me and says, look what I found. And it's a cerulean warbler. And here's Katie sitting there just flabbergasted. Here I am. I've never touched a cerulean warbler in my life. And we banned the bird. And we took a picture of it. With the book. With the book. <laughs> with me holding the bird in my hand up against the book. And it's sort of cerulean warbler, cerulean warbler, cerulean warbler, and Katie Fallon. And I give you Katie at this point. So here she is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hilton, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming and for listening to us talk. And thank you to the festival for having me and the birds and Cheyenne back again. This is um, my 11th festival. So that seems like a long time. And I measure things. This, the children that Bill mentioned, that's how I sort of measure when things happen. <laughs> And I was pregnant with the first one at the first festival that I came to. So um, we're very excited to be here. So uh, thank you very much again. So I have a very short PowerPoint um, to go through, and then we'll get the birds out. Can you see it if the lights are on more pretty well? OK. OK, it's, it's pretty short. This is just my warm up. <laughs> Hopefully you've all seen, the, you've all seen this, this meme, right? I didn't, I didn't make this, they found it on the internet, that I'm the queen of, apparently. So, um, anyway, mostly what I'm, I'm going to talk about um, is the, the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, the um, organization that I'm a co-founder of, along with my husband and a few of our friends. And, um, and now I am the, that's my daughter. Yep, that's, that's Stella. That's four-year-old Stella. The youngest. Some of you have um, something weird happening. Oh, some of you have. Um, oh, Barbara. No, I don't even use my phone. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Um, that's the four-year-old Stella who has been at the festival in the little baby Bjorn, um, right? You know, before COVID, where she missed a couple, but and she runs around here sometimes and cries and. She's a birder. Yeah. She's actually the, the other, the older two are like thinks birds are okay, but Stella really likes birds. She, she will say, Mommy, we go on the porch and look at birds with me. And I could just sort of die, <laughs> you know, happy at that point. So um, anyway, but uh, mostly I'm going to talk about um, the work at the, that we do at the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. Um, also, I am a writer, and I do have some books up here. And if you've been to the festival in the past, you've seen presentations about the vulture book. Um, vultures are the best birds, right? And we saw several today um, on our trip to Kanawha Falls, lots of turkey vultures and some black vultures too. And I also wrote a book about cerulean warblers that also came out 11 years ago. Um, and then I have a couple of books for kids that I co-wrote. Oh, and I've got, look at this, assistants are awesome. Um, and then the, the kids book, um, I only, I have, there's two of them, but I only have the one. 
uh, called Look, See the Farm that I co-wrote with Bill Wilson, who is one of the, uh, one of the owners of Birds and Beans Coffee. And Bill said, uh, I have ideas for some books for kids to get them to start to see the connection between birds and farms and organic and healthy practices, but I can't make words good. <laughs> so, uh, so we worked, they were really his ideas and I just sort of wrote the words. So that is the kest our kestrel who keeps bopping around in there. Um, he really likes a party um, and he hears us and is like, why am I still in the box? But we'll get him out in a minute. Um, but to, to, this is Cheyenne Carter, too, I want to introduce you to. And many of you have met Cheyenne before. <laughs> and, uh, she is the, um, I'm the executive director of ACCA, I may have mentioned or not. Cheyenne is our bird trainer and educator. And she works with the non-releasable birds um, all the time and knows them very well and takes excellent care of them and weighs them and gives them toys and um, sings to them. and. All, all of that stuff. Uh, so I'm excited that she's here and brought these birds down. And she's also a birder also, and has been a birder for m much of her life. 15 years. 15 years right? And she's only 16, so. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So anyway. So let me tell you a little bit about, a little bit about the ACCA um, before we get these birds out. So we were founded in 2012. Um, so we've also been around for like 11 years. This is kind of this 11 year thing is really, um, you know, interesting. I had a lot go on that year. Uh, and our mission um, at the ACCA is to conserve the region's wild birds, try to get out of the way, through research, education, and rehab. So it seems like a strange thing to do with a bunch of your friends, like let's start a nonprofit that is going to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but we did it, and we, we, we didn't want to say that we were a bird rescue or bird rehab or something. We wanted to found a conservation center that we really could fit, could be an umbrella to fit a lot of the projects that we thought were important that we wanted to work on with the community. So research is the one that we do the least of, so I started with it here to talk about it. One of our research projects that we do, we partner with Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, um, USGS, West Virginia University, and we travel to, yes, Kelly, we're going to get you out soon. We travel to turkey vulture nests um, when there's chicks in the nest. And you have to have a permit to do this stuff, right? You can't just go in and be like, hello, babies, I'm going to grab you out and, and you know, do things to you. You have to have a federal and state permits to do this. We travel to turkey vulture nests. We um, take the babies out of the nests, do some measurements, take blood samples to test for lead poisoning which is sort of its own presentation. And then we put wing tags on the birds, which allow people to uh, look through binoculars and see them and read the wing tags. And then they can report to the federal bird banding lab you know, where they saw the bird. And you heard um, you know, Bill's talking about bird banding um, and hummingbird banding and other bird banding with the, with the cerulean. Why can't you put metal leg bands on a turkey vulture? Would they get corroded? Yes. Yes, because they expel liquid waste, right, onto their legs um, as a way to thermoregulate. And there's a word for it. We call it an accident in my house when someone <laughs> pees on their legs. But, but it, is, it is urohydrosis. What? Urohydrosis. So if that ever happens to you, you can say it's just a little bit, it's just a little warm. So. So we, put, we can't put the metal leg bands because they, they will corrode, but we put wing tags. And I saw these wing tags when, I, when, I, when we got the packet of wing tags that we were going to have to put on these vultures. I thought, wow, that's really, those are really big wing tags, and I'm like a vulture hugger. Um, and then it was explained to me that these are the same kind of wing tags used on the California condors. And before they put them on condors, they tested them pretty extensively on turkey vultures. <laughs> Uh, and they can still fly around with them and, and everything. So, so we put wing tags on uh, baby turkey vultures. We've been doing it for about 10 years or 11 years probably. Thanks, Joanne. So I wanted to show you this baby turkey vulture for a specific reason. So this was 2017, so five years ago, when we took this picture, this baby picture. 
And then this is 2023. That same turkey vulture with that wing tag was caught on a trail cam. That, and, and we knew it was our turkey vulture because the, of the wing tag number. And we traced it back. We know where the bird nested. And this, this camera caught was only a few miles from where we had tagged the bird in western Pennsylvania. But I thought that was wonderful. He's all grown, he or she, all grown up. Look at those gorgeous feathers. Found himself a cow. <laughs> so clearly, you know, doing well. And, and we've had about, over the years, we've had, um, we've probably put bands on, you know, tw 20 or 30 turkey vultures. And we have re have recited ones that have been reported or shown up or something, about five. The furthest distance anyone had reported one of our tagged turkey vultures was in West Palm Beach, which was pretty cool. And I, I asked, like, at Mar-a-Lago, like, was that where it was? But, but it was not. It was not. It was at a wildlife management area. But, and, but it, the only thing remarkable about the bird, it was eating with other turkey vultures, is it had a wing tag. So we were able to hear about it and, and learn that our little western Pennsylvania turkey vulture went all the way to West Palm Beach. So that's sort of a lot of the research that we work on. And then education, we're gonna, we, I'm not going to show many slides of education because we're going to have live birds out in a second, but this is a peregrine falcon. We saw peregrine falcons today um, on our trip, and many of you have probably seen them, or you will see them during this week. And this is um, the peregrine falcon who's in our care. Her name is Tundra, and she's been at the festival um, several, several years. She's um, an Arctic the Arctic subspecies, the tundra subspecies of peregrines. That's a long distance migrant that kind of leapfrogs over the entire American peregrine population. So tundra, the, this bird was injured during her first migration to, south, to the tropics uh, when she hit, we think, power lines in Elkins, West Virginia, um, and ended up with us and, and never, has, uh, never made her flight to the tropics. But anyway, I wanted to put her up here because we saw, we saw some peregrines today, and she's not here. And then rehab is probably the other part of our mission. That's probably what we spend most of our day-to-day -day time working on. Uh, rehab is, um, I know um, several of you volunteer at wildlife rehab centers in different capacities, and it's, it's hard work. It's emotionally taxing. And I always have the nagging worry that, like, are these birds actually going out and going to make it? You know, or are they, or are we, you know, but we know some of them do because we put, we do have some, we had a turkey vulture wearing a transmitter that survived for at least two or three years wearing the transmitter before the transmitter stopped working. And we had a barred owl. I will tell you this story quickly. We had a barred owl come in injured. Uh, that was shot in the head, and that was not that was not dead. That was alive, and it had you know bruising obviously and some eye trauma. But the bird uh, we healed up, and was able to be released back to the wild. And we, in retrospect, we maybe should not have taken it back to where it was from. You're sort of supposed to release the birds where they're where they're found, um, and barred owls, you know stick around um, all year usually uh, in an area so we released this barred owl near where he was found and about four years later someone found a dead barred owl and brought it back to us and it was the, we knew it was the same bird because we had it had been banded we have a we work with a bird bander who bands our raptors before release um, and this owl had been shot in the head again oh which is crazy <laughs> I don't know, someone and yeah, so, so, but we knew it was the same owl because of the bird band, but we also knew our rehab was successful because the owl lived for four years um, in the wild, even though he was ultimately, you know, re-injured. So anyway, so these little guys, these are baby eastern screech owls, and this is sort of the, you know, the worry, the nagging worry of my, my life currently, I think, is that, you know, we have... This was five baby screech owls that a tree came down. Um, the adults, the best thing to do when that happens is to try to get the birds re-nested if possible in a surrogate, put up a surrogate box and put the babies in and watch, and the adults will usually hear them and come and continue to feed them. Uh, but in this case, the birds were sort of, the tree came down, they didn't see any adults, the birds sort of got um, kind of 
passed to one group and then passed to another group before they made it to us and it wasn't possible to get them, get them back <laughs> where they were from. So we are raising them, or doing our best, and this is their current surrogate. And this is a wild screech owl um, who was in for rehab. We did, not, we did not feel comfortable putting the screech owls, the baby screech owls, with our education screech owls because they are human raised. Our screech owls that we use for education are like, think they're people sort of. And we didn't know, we thought maybe they would not, um, not nurture or eat the babies, stuff like that. So this is a wild screech owl. Oh my gosh, Killy. Is that Ohio? Or, okay. Um, who's in, in for rehab, and so far we haven't seen the, the adult actually feeding the babies, but uh, sits near them and at least they can see the, see the adult. Uh, hopefully that will work. And then now there are six babies because we added another baby screech owl that, that made its way to us. That's a little bit older than the ones in the nest who, who is like all over that adult, like, <laughs> hey, feed me, feed me. So. This is another um, situation that we have going on right now. Uh, this, is, this is a great horned owl that we um, kind of, th there was another local center, nearby center to us that shut down um, about two, a year and a half ago or so, or two years ago, and transferred all their birds to us when they ceased operations. And this was one of their um, educational great horned owls. And we don't really feel that he's appropriate to be used for educational programs. He's far too stressed out, and we don't think that's a good job for him. We thought that he could be a display great horned owl, maybe, but that stressed him out also. But now we have found his job, because he is fostering this baby great horned owl that um, ended up in our care. And they are uh, together all the time. Um, I don't know if he feeds the, the baby actually or not, but I suspect that he does and we just haven't seen it. We try to kind of leave them alone. But he's doing a great, great job. And if this is his job, then that can be his job. And then this, you may, if you saw this video, you might have to hit the button again to make it play. Yeah. So this is a, a bird we had last year. So this was a, um, a, a wild in rehab barred owl and a um, baby barred owl that ended up on the ground. And we thought, we, I was taking this video hoping the adult was gonna feed that to the baby on video, but of course she didn't. But, but what ended up happening with these two, uh, we were able to, re we released them both at the same time. Uh, they, they went from being inside together to being in an outside enclosure together um, until they were, you know, the baby was, you know, picking up, eating, feeding itself. Uh, and then we, we released them at the same, the same time. So I don't know if they, and they were both banded before release and we haven't heard anybody <laughs> recovering the bands. So hopefully they're out there doing their thing. Uh, this also, you could just hit the button again. So speaking of fostering, this is, we're again in the, in the start of baby bird season. So I don't know if you know this, but Canada goose, Canada geese will adopt chicks that aren't their own chicks. So this was a chick that ended up with us that somebody found by itself. And you know, we, we kind of gave the baby a vet exam, you know, gave it some food and let it rest for a while and rehydrated it. And then Cheyenne drove around trying to find, um, <laughs> trying to find um, babies of the same age. And, and then she found them and that baby was like, woohoo! And, and the adults were like, what are you doing over there with that human? You know, come on. So it was a great, great that they, they just went off together. So uh, I want to brag about us for one moment too. So this is, um, at, I don't know if you recognize the man in the bow tie, um, but that's um, Gordon Gee, who's the president of West Virginia University. And Morgantown, where we live, is uh, the home of West Virginia University, right? It's, and many of our volunteers are WVU students. We have about 40 volunteers. And we also are a community partner of West Virginia University. So we are able to get, um, students can log their volunteer hours and they get a special cord when they graduate that says they did so much you know, community service, volunteer hours. We also are able to get federal um, work study students who can get paid to come work at ACCA through the, through the federal work study program through WVU. And these students in the picture with Cheyenne and myself are three students who were part of a 
senior capstone multidisciplinary studies class where a service learning class where the students choose uh, a community partner nonprofit to work with and then um, spend all semester working on projects with that nonprofit. So these were the students who worked with us from this class. And then we also found out like a week or two ago, and I should have brought this to show you in real life, but I forgot about it. We won the award, the West Virginia University Award for the Outstanding Community Partner. So we were, <laughs> we were, we were, uh, we were, we were really, we were very excited to win that award. Um, we went to a, Cheyenne and I went to a nice ceremony and it was very fancy, and, like there was wine and, you know, <laughs> like we, we curled our hair, like it was, it was, uh, it was very nice. It was a lot of fun, but we were, we were really proud of that. Yep. Um, this, hit it one more time there. These are birds I wanted to show you quick that aren't, or don't travel well. Boris, this turkey vulture, has been at the festival before. Um, and then that's Lou, who doesn't travel well. <laughs> and then this is Cheryl, Cheryl the crow, right? <laughs> and and uh, sh these are, again, these are, these are all non-releasable birds that live at our sort of newly constructed um, outdoor classroom that we're, that we're using to house uh, our, all of our non-releasable birds we hope will live out at the outdoor classroom where people can come and visit them more easily than where we are right now. So these are, you know, our, our little pack of five scavengers, um, but they're not, they're not all, the three, two turkey vultures and the crow are together and one of the turkey vultures and the black vulture um, are together. Uh, we're not sure if we'll be able to put them all together eventually or not, but, but the, the two turkey vultures in with the crow are pretty badly handicapped. And then the black vulture and the other turkey vulture are not as badly handicapped. So that's, um, the vulture all the way on the far left in the back is Vader. Vader, Vader. yep, like the, the black vulture is, <laughs> the black vulture is Maverick, and Maverick was found um, in the parking lot of a bar called Mavericks. And uh, Boris in the front, Boris is a female, the finder named her Boris. And Lou, the one you can see there is from Lewis County, and he, Lou was hit by a car um, Maverick was hit by a car, but Vader and Boris were both gunshot, um, which is really, there's no any, not any reason to shoot a turkey vulture, right? They're an obligate scavenger that's not, um, not causing anybody any harm. Is that Ohio still in there? Oh, gosh. So this is, this is uh, a short video. This, this is Kanane the red-tailed hawk who has been here at the festival before, and she spends a lot of time on her new swing. And I, think it's, I just think it's kind of cute that she goes on there and sort of um, makes the thing, seems to make it move. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of a, yeah. And then our, my last little video here. This is, um, this is uh, Mac the bald eagle. Uh, Mac is short for Potomac because he was from uh, the north branch of the Potomac is where he was found injured. And we hope that he will be sort of a glove bird and travel and stuff someday, but he is, uh, he's not there yet. And he may never be, and if he's not, it's okay. But right now, his, his, his job, he lives out at the outdoor classroom and people can come and visit him. So our, our theory about how his injuries occurred, we think he lost a fight with another eagle. He had um, uh, a fracture and bad soft tissue damage that has resolved, but he doesn't, he doesn't have, he has his wings, but he doesn't have great, great use of one of them. Um, it had, we're not sure what else could have caused the punctures other than another bald eagle. And it was in the early winter, kind of when a lot of territorial stuff gets started. So poor, poor guy, um, probably lost, lost a fight. And I think that that is the end. So that's Cora. That's my that Cora named after two different bird species. Can anyone guess? Common raven. Common raven. <laughs> and the other one is a black vulture's Cora gyps atratus. Oh. So my like sweet baby girl is named after two like you know carrion eating <laughs> feisty feisty birds. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. And then Cheyenne is going to go ahead and start to get some birds out, birds out here. Um, 
I guess I don't know that there ha they, we have any rules specifically when birds come out, except you can take pictures of them if you want to. Um, the first bird she's going to get out is one who's probably going to be the most nervous because she hasn't been doing this very long. We tried to bring some birds. A lot of you have been to the festival before in the past, and I know that uh, you've seen many of our birds before. So we brought different birds. So we had a different barn owl years and years ago. But this is a barn owl, obviously, right? So this, her name is Georgia. And you may have n noticed that we sometimes will name birds where they're from, like Tundra, the peregrine falcon, and Maverick from Maverick's bar. So jo Georgia has a very strange story. So I hope I, I it's, it's, I'll try to tell it well. Uh, she, the, her story is, someone drove a logging truck uh, in Georgia, and this person who drove the logging truck uh, would often find baby animals that would kind of fall off the truck um, after the logs were loaded on it, and he would take them home and raise them. And then somehow he had a friend in West Virginia who, who liked barn owls, uh, and he gave this barn owl, the man from Georgia, to his friend in West Virginia, and that guy built a pen in his yard and was going to keep it as a pet. Um, and then he said he only had it a week um, and then realized that he was supposed to turn it over to somebody. So I don't know if that's, I don't know how much of that is true, but the owl is a human raised barn owl. Um, so she can't, can't go back to the wild safely once that happens. Why, why not? Like if you have a human raised raptor. Right, that, that is imprinted humans. It will come to humans. Will come to humans for food is one of the biggest, biggest worries, right? Not afraid of humans. Humans, we would be like, oh my gosh, a barn owl is visiting me. I will give it all my hot dogs, right? <laughs> but um, if a barn owl continually approached people for food and didn't have a fear of people, and, and uh, the bird would end up getting injured intentionally or unintentionally by humans. Uh, and sometimes that would be really dangerous also. So Georgia, uh, barn owls are not super tough birds. Sorry, Georgia. But, you know, they're a little bit, they don't weigh very much. Georgia only weighs about 450 grams, right? 501. 501. Putting on weight. So she only weighs about 501 grams. So that's only a little bit more than a pound. So it's a small bird. Uh, but even, but if you notice Cheyenne's, Cheyenne and Georgia are good friends, but you notice that Cheyenne's wearing that glove, um, the talons can definitely hurt you. And if she was desperate for food, wasn't doing well, um, surviving, and she approached a person for food and landed on their, their face, <laughs> you know, it would not be a good, it, would, it could be dangerous. We have another bird who doesn't, who has, doesn't travel well yet for the public, <laughs> um, who's a barred owl um, named Jeff. Um, from, from Jefferson County, West Virginia. And he is a head lander. Like, he lands on heads. And it's one of the reasons that we are nervous about taking him. And we, we Cheyenne and I have worked a lot with Jeff flying. He will fly glove to glove, and, which is super cool, and we want to do it at programs. But he also lands on heads of men. So, and he's another human raised owl. Several of the birds here we have, actually all of the birds we have here are birds that have been with humans from a young age. So while it's very sad, they can't go back to the wild, um, they also make great educational birds. And it's, um, it's unfortunate in a lot of ways that they are, can't live the lives that they were you know, supposed to. But on the other hand, um, they do a really great job going around and talking to, talking to people and getting kids and adults a chance to see the birds up close. Um, which you're not normally going to get to see, right, a barn owl um, up close. Like, I look for birds, like all of you, I look for birds literally, like, every minute of every day, right? And I think I have only seen a barn owl... Oh, Jeff Heater, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I have only seen a barn owl maybe twice in the wild. You know, maybe three times in the wild. You know, not very often. In West Virginia, we don't have a whole lot of barn owls. 
Maybe they have more in Georgia. I mean, the barn owls I've seen, one was in, one was in California, the barn owl that I saw, and then one was in West Virginia, or two were in West Virginia, but there's only little pockets in West Virginia where you can find barn owls because they need open space. Georgia's like, I'm thinking about flying to the fan. Um, they need a big open spaces to hunt, right? So farm fields, um, some, they have this very beautiful, buoyant flight over fields. Uh, and they eat a lot of voles. Um, in West Virginia, we don't have a whole lot of areas with these big open, open areas. Uh, the Moorfield area has some barn owls. Um, Greenbrier, the Greenbrier Valley has some barn owls. Where else has barn owls? That might be. Yeah, it's not. Preston County says they have some barn owls, but it's not, not, they're not common in West Virginia. And in a lot of states, they're, um, they're not doing so well. So uh, everywhere, barn owls are a very widespread owl that live in um, many different places all around the world. And nearly everywhere they live, they eat voles, different species of voles, depending on where they live um, in the world. And in West Virginia, they eat a lot of meadow voles. And Georgia can go back whenever she's, because she's, she's actually doing great. She's only been to maybe three or four, four or five programs. Maybe only four or five programs. Quick sure. Uh, that answers my question. <laughs> oh. Uh, Georgia, Georgia can fly. Is that, was that, the, yeah, Georgia can fly. And she is actually, Cheyenne's been working on, on training her to, well, she's, the birds inside the crates are a little bit like, doo, doo, doo. she wants to go sit somewhere and just kind of hang out there. Chill out, yeah. Chill out, yeah. But Cheyenne's been working on getting her to fly to the glove. You see Cheyenne doing this little thing. That's the cue to fly to the glove. And she's got, in her enclosure at our outdoor classroom, we found a big wagon wheel. Like, you're trying, like BWD is telling stories with the covers of their magazines. We're trying to tell stories with um, some of our enclosures. So we uh, buried this wagon wheel and wrapped it like a perch. So it's sort of, you know, farmy, right? Like barn owl. And she has a roosting box that we have, have a local artist who's going to paint, it, paint the side of it to look like a barn, like a red barn. Uh, anyway, and we are, we are hopeful that Georgia will be a bird. So Georgia will be a bird. We hope that we'll fly, be able to fly glove to glove eventually in programs. And she's not going to be a, a headlander because she's human raised, but she's not um, bad. <laughs> we, we, went, we saw, really, Cheyenne and I went to a conference um, a couple months ago, and, and a bird training conference, because they have those, which is sort of, a, sort of awesome. And Cheyenne and I are both certified professional bird trainers, which we just got our certification recently, which is, um, yeah, we're kind of we're excited about that. <laughs> But um, at the bird training conference, they we talked about how imprinting uh, is poorly understood. That's the process that you know baby birds go through when they develop their familial attachment to whatever is raising them, right? But it's not it's not well understood, and there's the different ideas that we have about imprinting. Uh, we learned I learned during this presentation about someone who came up with the idea of imprinting was like a Nazi. Does anyone know? Yes, 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 yeah. Conrad Lorenz, um, a Nazi. I think he was an actual Nazi. Yeah. So, so, uh, did he reform? No. Oh. Well before World War II. Well, the Nazis were before World War II. Yeah, but he was like before he became a Nazi. Before he became a Nazi, he did his research. So. Yes, geese, yep. So a lot of our ideas about imprinting um, kind of come from that. And, and Killy's another, this is Killy, an American kestrel. He's another one that we're working on. Killy's like, hey. <laughs> uh, I'm getting, I've got distracted. Imprinting is, um, again, not, not, the process is not well understood. And there seem to be different, like a spectrum of imprinting, right? So Georgia is human raised, but is not the kind of bird that I can put my hands on and snuggle. And if any of you remember a long time, years ago, we had a barn owl named Luna 
who came to a couple of festivals, who was also a human, Luna passed away a couple years ago. She was also a human raised barn owl, but she was like a hard imprint barn owl that we knew wasn't going to be releasable. So I like snuggled the heck out of Luna because I knew she wasn't going back to the wild and I wanted to make sure she was comfortable. Look at that, Killy. Nice. Um, <laughs> but Georgia is not as, you know, seriously imprinted. This kestrel, however, um, is pretty sure that um, pretty sure that he's a little person or that we are big kestrels or I mean it's not um, yeah so kestrels falcons imprint very very fast so what often will happen with baby falcons a tree falls down something like that baby kestrels end up on the ground and Shane will be able to bring him bring Killy around um, and that was a rouse that he just did that means I'm he's pretty comfortable oh I forgot, I meant there's another kestrel I have to get out. Um, but the story of Killy is he, somebody found him as a young chick out of the nest, took him home, had him for just a couple days, probably fed him and cuddled him, uh, and then they transferred him over to uh, the DNR. And I think somebody from the DNR only had him for another couple days. And then he got to us, and you know we were like, okay, there's a baby nestling kestrel, cover it up, you know, let's make sure this kestrel only sees our other kestrel. No one look at the kestrel, right? And we lifted it up to peek at him, and he was like, <laughs> you know, here I am, like, hello. Oh my gosh, finally someone's here. And it was pretty obvious that it was already um, too late. Too, How old too late. When you got him? Uh, fuzzy, fuzzy, a little fuzzy guy. Yeah. Yep. So that makes him good at this job, but unfortunately it makes it so he can't go back to the wild. So I know that um, Cheyenne doesn't have the mic, but if she talks about Killy for a second while she walks, will that mess so, up everything? Um, Killy, because I do a lot of programs with children, so um, part of me wants to bring her back. That would be us. Pieces, pieces, yep. Yeah, that's really cool. He's got a mic for you, though. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no, she says. <laughs> I'm a heavy breather. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want to talk about keep, <laughs> <laughs> the head, keeping the head still? Where they um, keep the head still and you move them. Oh, yeah, and they keep their head yeah. still? It's really cool. Uh, before she talks about it, you oh, notice that ahead. both of them just roused. Um, both of them got real puffy and fluffed up all their feathers and um, shake, shake them up a little bit. Uh, those, we consider that a comfort behavior, and we call it rousing. And so they're definitely both very comfortable here. So this, I didn't tell you about this bird yet either. I don't think Cheyenne did, right? No. So no, this bird here, so this is nearly the same story as Killy. Um, 
This is, did she eat that or drop it? She ate it, right? <laughs> oh, but I'm in the poop. Okay. <laughs> so this is, she has nearly the same story that, um, that Killy has. This is a, a young kestrel that ended up on the ground. We usually get five or six baby kestrels every spring that come in from very, they're not always from the same nests. They come in from various different places. Um, just end up on the ground, people pick them up, and some of them are bird napped. Some of them, some of them were able to re-nest, but not, um, not, oh do you want that little baby? No. Okay. So often when we get these kestrel, baby kestrels in, we, we can put them all together. You know, we put them all in the same, same enclosure together. Uh, we try to set them up with the, with the surrogate or foster if we can. Um, if we can't, we can even sometimes, uh, set them up so they can see another kestrel, even if we don't let them actually interact. And it usually works, works well. However, uh, this, this kestrel was part of a group. There were about six, five or six kestrels. Um, all of them were wild, did not like us. Uh, this one came in from um, Wheeling, the Wheeling area, so Ohio County, West Virginia, so her name is Ohio. And she spent a few days just getting to us with other, with, before she was with other kestrels, and here she is, <laughs> not afraid of people. Um, all the other kestrels would retreat to the back when we would like come to clean or feed, and she would come right to the front of the enclosure. So, so uh, she's stuck with us also. You're not eating that, you're just throwing it around. Playing catch. Playing catch. But, so she, kestrels don't always do well living together, falcons in general, so, so Killy and Ohio do not live together, um, although they see each other, they see each other pretty frequently. But she hasn't been doing programs very long, um, and she's, she's a great little bird, and when Cheyenne comes back in and you see them side by side, you'll notice some of the differences, some of that sexual dimorphism that Cheyenne was talking about. Um, female kestrels don't have that, that same blue on the wings, that the male kestrels do, and the blue on the head is not, less, just less colorful overall. They still have um, the eyes on the back of the head though. Uh, that I think is a really cool thing about, about kestrels. Uh, of course, it's hard to see the back of a kestrel's head because she does not gonna want to, not gonna wanna do that. Oh, there's your friend. And She's not hungry, yeah. Oh, and this that we're doing, we should, um, Cheyenne mentioned it a little bit, this is just positive reinforcement. That since we, um, we try to, we do train all of our birds with positive reinforcement, we don't, we try not to force them to do anything. We ask, we uh, try, to try to entice them, and then we reward the behaviors that we wanna see happen again, right? So it's like if you wanna get a gold star, you keep doing the same thing, right? Or if you wanna get paid, you keep going to work. It was a less, less fun way to think about it, right? Um, and food is sort of the universal. Oh, oh yeah, switch, sorry. I forgot, about, I forgot about the camera. And food, if you think about it, some people say, oh, food, you're just bribing the bird or you're, you know, um, bird's not, it's somehow not good or whatever to use food um, to train birds. But really, we use food to train people too. Right, I mean like where do you go if you're going on a date with someone, you go out to dinner, right? If your family is all coming over, you have like a big family, you make dinner for everybody. I mean it's sort of, food is kind of a, um, and it's, it's, it's in our biology, you know, we have to eat, right? We have to eat, it keeps us alive. It's a, it's a primary reinforcer, food. It's happy, food makes us happy, like on that bus, Whenever the, you know, today when like Jeff got that bag of chocolate out, I was like, oh yeah, I'll have some chocolate, you know? So, so anyway, I don't wanna, I don't, we still have two more birds, so I don't wanna, so we're, we're gonna put these little guys away and then we'll, oh, go ahead. Yeah. The bobbing of the head can that the bird was doing. Oh, can I show you? Yeah. I've seen that where hmm. the bird will fixate and if you move it, don't. it will keep its head I don't know. Yeah, so they can focus. Yeah. I don't know if I can like get I her. I danced to... once with Kelly, and he like kept his head more. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if I can get her to. Yeah. <laughs> Other birds do it too. Yeah. Good. Good. 
Can you dance? <laughs> He's like, no. He says, I don't know. Yes. Ooh. No. No, I think they, I think they, unless, sometimes if we get birds in um, from a, a situation like if we had a bird that was illegally kept or something that maybe wasn't getting proper nutrition, they molt differently often. Um, but it seems to me that like the, the birds usually seem to molt the same as they would in the wild. <laughs> At least, most, mostly. Unless something happens that causes it to change. Would you ever mate those two? No. No, I don't think it would. I also don't think it would. I don't think that they would um, know what they were. I don't think they would know what they were doing. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Do you know how, are you good at getting that thing yeah. in there? Okay. Do you want to go with your friend? And she didn't. That's, she didn't really eat any food. Nope. nope. Don't go to Neo. Here you go. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think that either one of them would really have a good sense of like what. Um, you got go in. How that would, okay. how it would go. Yeah, yeah. And also, we don't we don't want any of our birds any of our bird, we don't have a propagation permit or anything, and you have to have another you permit to, in. to um, propagate. Yeah, and kestrels. Um, none of the birds that we have are really species of special, con you know, special concern or of conservation. Nobody's endangered or threatened or anything. Peregrines um, are the closest bird that we would have, we would have to being at ACCA, being um, endangered or threatened, and they were removed from the list. I think in 1999. Is that correct? 1999. Well, they are. The kestrels are in decline. They're not, at least they're not federally listed as have any special, but, but in the eastern part of their, several parts of their range, they are in decline. And there are a couple different thoughts about why that might be. Um, one thought is that the habitat changes. Um, there's not as many grasslands. Um, another thought is that uh, Cooper's hawks um, are doing pretty well overall and moving into some, as areas change from maybe grasslands to more forested areas um, and Cooper's hawks move in. Cooper's hawks will eat kestrels. Um, we were at a program once uh, with a kestrel talking, talking outdoors, talking about this very thing. And a Cooper's hawk flew out of the woods at us. The kestrel jumped off the glove, blah, 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 blah you know. Um, and, the, and the Cooper's hawk was like, whoops, and just turned around and flew the other direction. But it, it was like, cue the Cooper's hawk. And actually, there's even a worse story that I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but you're a friendly crowd. <laughs> so we have, we have lovely student volunteers, right? Undergraduate students who, are, who, who love, you know, and our wonderful volunteer, Colton, um, the first time he was handling a bird, he had Ohio um, taking our... Part of our property borders a state forest, so we can go for walks and we can take the birds and show them, put them on rocks and on trees and stuff like that and just kind of change their, you know, change what they're thinking about. Um, he was taking Ohio for a walk and a Cooper's hawk attacked her on the glove. Oh, yeah. While on the glove, like while a human was standing right there, oh, 10 feet from the door to ACCA. Wow. And Cheyenne said she was, Cheyenne was a few, like 10 feet away maybe, right? <laughs> And she said she looked over and saw, like, Colton doing something, and she was like, what is he doing to the kestrel? You know, what is he doing? And, and it was a cooper, and they were ta kind of tangled up together. Cheyenne was like, um, you know, mama kestrel mode, and got, got, them, got them apart. Uh, Ohio was uninjured physically. She was scared to go in that area, but physically uninjured, and she taloned the heck out of the cooper's hawk. <laughs> And we brought the Cooper's hawk in, in the vet into the <laughs> into rehab <laughs> briefly because of, for the puncture wounds. Um, but the Cooper's hawk was okay, and we did release it again. But Cheyenne would gave it a talking to. <laughs> Cheyenne, Cheyenne was like, "Don't you do that again!" And the Cooper's hawk is like, "I don't know what's going on." So, so. 
So this is a bird that I've been talking about bringing here, and I'm embarrassed because this bird's tail feathers are broken, which is like sort of his crowning feature, but we'll just overlook that till he molts those in. This is a bird who is, if you see his head right now too, he's, his head is also molting. Um, but he had spent the winter indoors, and Cheyenne will bring him back and walk around with them too. He has spent the winter indoors. Um, he has, yeah, because where would he be in the winter? Actually, first, in Central America. yes, or South America even. What is this bird? Does anyone know? Swallowtailed kite. Did anybody see one during this festival yet? No. no. That's a big stretch, buddy. So this is this is Shadow the swallowtailed kite. And what is a swallowtailed kite doing in West Virginia? Good question. We don't really know. So the story on this bird, so that other center I mentioned that shut down and transferred all their birds to us, this was one of the birds that they used for education. And the story on him is that someone found him in a barn in Barber County, West Virginia, and thought it was a, like a pigeon, a strange pigeon. And they, they, they called and said, there's a strange pigeon pigeon in my barn, I think, but maybe it's, it might be a, a raptor. Um, so uh, the other center went and picked him up and uh, said, like, this bird is not afraid of people at all. So I don't know what, I don't know exactly how he, um, a, a very friendly swallowtailed kite ended up in a barn in central West Virginia. So whatever the case, um, He's a super sweet bird. <laughs> His name is Shadow. And he is uh, at least about um, eight years old at minimum. Uh, I, I apologize for his tail. I'm so disappointed about it. Because it's, he just is, he just breaks it. It's a ridiculous tail. He's, he's, he's molting also, but it's still just, uh, but it did, it just, his tail feathers break because they're ridiculously long. Um, and it's just sort of a, I don't like to see it because it, it makes it, you know, if they break, but a swallowtailed kite, if you've seen them, they spend a lot of time flying, very, you know, very buoyantly flying, flying. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, he is very, very sweet, but it, it's sort of difficult to maintain his physical appearance <laughs> with those long feathers. Um, living under human care, but we hope when they come back in we're going to try to devise a better way to have him next winter so he doesn't have to come inside, which is where he breaks his tail feathers when he's inside. Uh, he doesn't break them when he's outside and he's he's got he's in a smaller space in the winter and he does breaks them. So we're, we're going to try to devise a plastic a system of maybe lowering plastic around his enclosure or something so so we can keep him out. But he's very, flies around a lot and is very, uh, I guess buoyant is the best word to describe it. Very buoyant. So, only about 400, 450 grams, the same as a barn owl. Same as a barn owl. He's all wings. He's very, very small. Can he fly without his tail? Oh, yes. He flies not as well. But he can fly. Yeah, sorry, he's just showing you his, here's my broken tail, everyone. When does he the tail? He seemed to just have his really nice feather when it started to get cold outside. Hopefully, um, we've, only, we've only had him for, we haven't had him for a super long time. Um, he was, they closed down about a year and a half ago. And then we had to go through the process of getting him added to our educational permit so we could take him out because birds on a rehab permit, they were all officially transferred as rehab birds, even though they were being used as, even though they were education birds at the other place, they all were transferred as rehab birds. And you're not allowed to show rehab birds to the public. They have to be on an education permit. So we couldn't, we have had to kind of just hang out with these birds for a while. Um, while they were transferred. So swallowtailed kites eat a lot of insects. You can see Cheyenne's giving them worms. Uh, in the wild, they eat a lot of um, uh, 
We were just like dragonflies. We were, we were talking about cicadas. Uh, he likes dubia roaches, which is what is somewhat like a cicada. He also likes waxworms, superworms, mealworms. Um, they've also, they also will eat a lot of wasps, apparently, in the wild, and they have like a, a coating on the inside of their digestive system that allows them to eat things with stingers, which I didn't really know before we got this bird and I had to learn about them. <laughs> um, they, are a, they are a fairly social species in that they will hang out in groups of kites and roost with swallow-tailed kites and with Mississippi kites will often roost together. So. They are not usually found much north of Florida, although they, are, they do seem to be pushing a little further and further north. Like it's not unheard of for swallow-tailed kites to show up in West Virginia. There are some state records. I think Jim said there's, there, Ohio had some every year. Every year. We just had one in Brooklyn. Brooklyn? Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, so Mrs. And Mississippi kites are, uh, you know, related species that also seems to be pushing a little further, further north. Maryland, when we had the cicadas. Mississippi kites yeah, we eating the cicadas, and you had one in Michigan. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Nice. We have, we have one nest in West Virginia that I know of of Mississippi kites. Yeah, that's new. Cicadas. That's only been a couple years. Swallowtailed kites. Um, Me too. But you know, the area of West Virginia where he showed up was. Pleasant Creek Wildlife Management Area. If any of you have ever heard of that place or been there, it's some um, strange things show up there. It's uh, it's like a swamp, and there have been there were spoonbills show up um, one year, and um, uh, black-bellied whistling ducks. So some things show up in that area that are southern things. I don't really know why, but the shrike yeah that was, that was something different but but that wildlife management area does get some strange strange birds in there often southern birds so you take them out so i don't um maybe he showed up there naturally but it's it, i mean he's i don't know he's very very friendly and not not a doesn't i don't imagine a wild kite would have that same behavior of being so so accustomed to people so nice to everybody so, um, while Cheyenne is walking out there, um, I can get another bird out because I feel like we've, I don't want to keep you sitting here forever. And this bird is really sort of special to me, um, and I'll tell you why once once we get her out. Actually, do you have any, any swallow-tailed kite questions? I'm not an expert on swallow-tailed kites. I'm still sort of learning about them. How long did they live? She's eight. Oh, gosh. I don't even know the longevity record on swallow-tailed kites. I mean, I would imagine this bird, I do know the longevity record, and it was, come on out, baby. Actually, now I forget that I said that. I think it was 18. So, I guess, hi, Kelly. Anyone know what kind of bird this is? Some of us saw one today. This is a broad-winged hawk. And I'm kind of waiting for her to go to the bathroom. So she's big. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, she is big. She's on a diet. <laughs> so her, she weighs a lot more than a regular broadwing should weigh. It's a little embarrassing. She weighs about 700 grams. And a broadwing should be more like 400, 500 grams. Yeah. She laid three eggs um, this, this fall, or sorry, this spring already. So the egg weight has come off. Uh, she's just, <laughs> but uh, broad-winged hawks under human care are known to be a species that, that can be obese. Um, and this is, this is the bird, we call her the perch potato. Uh, she's flighted broad-winged hawk. Um, however, she does not fly, um, even though she, she is flighted. Uh, Cheyenne's grandfather actually built special perches for her to use their sort of stairs. So she would have to jump a little bit um, up the stairs to sort of to get some exercise. And she doesn't like to do it. Uh, of course, it's like the stairmaster, like who likes that, right? She doesn't like doing it. So this bird is named, her name is Neo because she's a neotropical migrant, right? Broadwing hawks are a complete migrant. They all leave all leave the eastern U.S. and go to South America for the winter, Central and South America. And 
uh, none of them are here in the winter. And we often will get calls from people saying, I have a broadwing hawk, or they'll get reported you know, in January, but they are, they are all gone. They leave in September, um, and they don't come back until usually the first week of April is when I get my first broadwing hawk um, in West Virginia. So Neo is a female, obviously. She laid, um, laid eggs. She is uh, you know, the best broadwing hawk in the world, in my opinion, the entire planet. Part, part of the reason that this bird is um, special to me, and I'm, I'm not going to cry when I talk about it, <laughs> so, so that, and I know we're like live on Facebook, but the, uh, the other center that shut down that I mentioned was a place that I was involved with for many years and was on their board and I had like a kind of an unpleasant de departure, departure. And this was one of my birds um, from the other center that I actually rescued from the road after she got hit by a car oh um, in, in Tiger Lake State Park in 2010. Whoa. Oh, bring her here? Yeah, sure. So she, she was, um, I, I went and took the call to rescue her off the road, and she was a fledgling at the time. So she had probably just left her nest and got hit by a car in the state park. So the car wasn't going very fast, <laughs> so it was in, a, in the state park. And um, that's, that's north central West Virginia. And she, you can notice her left eye is messed up, right? So she's totally blind in that left eye. Uh, it doesn't cause her any pain, but it's, it's, she's blind in a, um, if a hawk can't see out of one eye, um, they, can't, they can't hunt successfully in the wild. And a broadwing hawk is not a species that really scavenges. Um, you could make an argument maybe for another bird that can scavenge, like a, a turkey vulture with one eye, you know, possibly you can release, they can scavenge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, but a, but a one-eyed um, broadwing hawk, we, uh, we, we can't release that bird back to the wild. So she's been um, under human care uh, since 2010. And she was uh, a bird that, you know, one of my ed birds that I started training um, at the other place. And I started training her using positive reinforcement. And... <laughs> She likes food a lot, <laughs> but you notice that I'm not even. She won't even really take. She's at the point where she doesn't really. She doesn't really take food anymore. She's like, ugh. Yeah. She doesn't. She's kind of. I guess if if you think about sometimes positive reinforcement, we kind of do more of it when they're learning a behavior. So she's already learned the behavior a long time ago. <laughs> You know, no. I have thought about that before. She does eat worms, though, also. She eats super worms, and she eats chicks and quail, although she seems to prefer mice to those things. And, uh, however, our red-tailed hawk, Canane, that's been here before, that was the one on the swing, snakes will sometimes get into her enclosure and, like, go in her water dish and stuff like that, and we're like, and then she eats them. She catches them and eats them in her enclosure. Yeah, hunting instincts are definitely there. So, so Neo is a uh, you know, little perch potato on a diet. Been doing this, been doing this job for for a long time, um, and is just a a great great little bird. And I can't I can't like believe that uh, you know that she came back. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, she's this is like a. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought because I'm sort of thinking about how kind of, yeah, <laughs> Cheyenne's going to laugh at me. So something else about broadwing hawks that I should mention. So this is a species, we said neotropical migrants, this is a species that is known to be found in shade-grown coffee farms uh, in, the, in, when, in the fall and the winter. So this is a species that shows up hunting, spending time in shade-grown coffee farms. So. Uh, she's a great bird to bring up the coffee that we have up there, the Birds and Beans Coffee. So Birds and Beans Coffee is a company based in Massachusetts, and it's a triple certified bird, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, bird friendly, uh, fair trade, and USDA organic. And ACCA is a conservation partner with Birds and Beans, so they let us 
uh, sort of sell their coffee as a fundraiser, we can get it at wholesale price and then sell it and like get a few dollars per bag. So that's what the birds and beans coffee is up there um, that we can we can sell and it's fourteen dollars a bag. It used to be a little less expensive, but it went up recently like everything else. <laughs> And it's four different, there's light roast, medium roast, medium dark, and dark. And decaf. Decaf. So what am I forgetting to say about Neo? Any questions about broadwing hawks or? Well, the talons on them, are they shorter than like, like Cooper's hawks seem to have very long nails. They do, yes. Cooper's hawks have very long toes and very long nails. And so do peregrine falcons. And um, I would imagine it has to do with what they eat, you know, with catching birds. Whereas a broadwing hawk is probably not catching very many birds. She's catching mostly amphibians, snakes, rodents. Uh, I mean, maybe some birds, but not, not a specialist, not like a bird specialist. And broadwing hawks, too, have that very high pitched whistling call, yeah. right? That pee pee. That you, it's really that you can hear sometimes. And one of, and I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Cold Mountain ever, yeah. but there's a broadwing hawk calling in the snow in that movie. And it like, <laughs> it really bothers me. <laughs> it really bothers me. Is she molting right now? Is that why that, that's oh, there? that's it right there. <gasps> she might do it, yeah. What is that? Oh, yes. Don't all of your female birds lay eggs? They don't. They don't. And I am, I... Are they spayed? They are not spayed. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure why some of them do and some of them don't. Um, I, I would imagine it's in part that Neo is very comfortable, very comfortable around, around people. But I don't think any of our other female birds lay eggs. Uh, and also, but it's it's interesting that that um, do chickens like do lay eggs. No, we she doesn't build a nest. She just kind of lays them. Okay. <laughs> uh, the they basically took over a squirrel's nest. A broadwing. Broadwing. Yeah. Mm. And then they put sticks on it, but it was you could still see the squirrel's nest kind of on, underneath it. What are you doing? We blow them out, and then and Cheyenne's very crafty, uh, and we she covers them with um like, Mod Podge. Yeah, and I don't think we brought them today, but we they do break kind of easily. So we but we save them and blow them out and show them to kids. So she didn't build a nest. No. Where did she lay them? It's just uh. Just on the ground. <laughs> yep, she doesn't. She doesn't have it. Didn't build any any sort of. I guess she didn't really have a whole lot of nesting material, though. So I mean, but I but she laid them last year too. Uh, you want to go on there, little baby? Oh, there you go, honey. Bigger the eggs? Smaller than a chicken egg. They're probably about that about that size. Maybe the size of a small chicken egg. They are. They are. They're, they're, they're not as modeled as like a red-tailed hawk egg, but they, they do have some, some modeling, some, some brown on them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's... <coughs> Maybe I miss this, but don't they form large flocks in fall migration? They do. No. Yes, kettles, fall migration. The broadwing hawk migration in the fall, if you go somewhere like Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, and there are a couple other places, Hanging Rock Tower in southern West Virginia. Um, there are kettles. The what river? The Detroit River. Detroit River. It's in the tens of thousands, probably, right? I mean, I mean, at one time, forty-four thousand. It's a. So on one up year, but the biggest kettle in Ohio ever was fifty-five thousand in one block. And that was in Detroit River. No, this is in Ohio. Yeah, Detroit River is in Ohio. It's in Sweden. 
Well, no, 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 it's it's in, not Michigan. almost. We, yeah. we don't. No, well, someone asked if she was molting, and she is starting to drop her feathers. That's a 13 year old bird. Yes. Oh my God. I think, I think the Broadring record was 18. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was a mouse, sorry. Yeah, it's dead, it's dead. It's not alive. I love the Al Qaeda and the bird banding lab has no longevity record for the species. No longevity record, all right. But there are some other sources that say six years is the max. Oh, no. Oh, no, Shadow, so old. When you got her, she was eight. All right, now, now she's eight. Yeah. He is eight. We've had him. No, we've had him for a year and a half. And yeah. Did you know he was six and a half when you got That's just when he was admitted. So he could have been older. That's when he was admitted to the other place. But he could have been even older. So he could be sort of an old. A lot of things live in captivity longer than they would. Certainly. Oh yes, absolutely. Turkey vultures. I think the wild longevity record for a turkey vulture is only something like 15 or 16 years old. Also, but there are captive turkey vultures that are in their 40s. So, so hopefully Neo will get to, will have a long, you know, are you taking her outside? Yeah, very good. Um, you know, long, long life. Frog wings? Wires going across the New River, way up. There's a frog wing sitting right on the very top. I've seen him do that too. Yeah. Neo does have a Neo does have a boyfriend um, who 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 uh, just I I mean who flies down um, pretty close. <laughs> well, she's in yeah she she's in close. I mean they would the, the cloacal kiss would have to like there would have to be some acrobatics through the through the enclosure. But she does have, I mean, she does have a, a, there's a male who hangs around, or I don't know if it's a male, it could be a female, but there's a wild, wild broadwing hawk that, that hangs out pretty close, pretty close to her enclosure. There's also those turkey, the, the turkey vultures and the black vulture, that little video, there are wild turkey vultures that roost on the edge of that enclosure also. <laughs> Which is sort of, and I don't know if it's that maybe there's leftover bits of food in there, that maybe they're like, hey. <laughs> How do we get at that? Why are you in there with all the food, you know, and we're out here? But, yeah. So, oh, the people who are outside. Yep. Yeah, so she's just visiting them. All right, I feel like I've been talking a long time. What, what other questions do you have? So we get, I, I feel like I skipped over some of this stuff, too. In the introduction, we at ACCA we get between five and six hundred birds a year in for rehab, which is sort of a lot for um, mostly volunteer organization. Again, we have forty or so volunteers, and we have about two part-time employees. Sometimes we have three, just depending on depending on the season and stuff like that. And we have a lot of interns that are unpaid. So on Monday, when I go back, I this Monday and then next Monday there are more. We're going to have 12 undergraduate student interns working all summer, 20 hours a week, each of them, feeding lots of baby birds. What's the most common species? What do you think it is? Yes, American robin. We get we get about 70 American robins a year. Oh, number two. Let me think. Blue Jay's up there. Blue Jay's probably top ten. Number two, I think, vary, vary, does vary a little bit. We get a lot of morning doves. Um, and then we also get a lot of red-tailed hawks. Red-tailed hawks might be in the top. They're in the top five for sure. We probably get something like 20 to 30 red-tailed hawks a year. Owls. Barred owl. So this this year was the first. Usually screech owls. Usually we have a lot of screech owls. Uh, this last year was the first year that the number of barred owls surpassed the number of screech owls. Are they mostly car from cars? Many. So I have. I have um, we try to figure. Many of them are unknown trauma. You know, birds that just show up injured. That someone that we don't really have a lot of information about. So we're on the same property as a veterinary hospital. 
for regular dogs and cats and stuff that's open 24 hours. And we, we, are, we have a little building on the same property, and then we have a room in the back that's just for our birds. So people can drop them off any time of the day and night. And we ask them to fill out a form with a lot of information, but sometimes we don't get a lot of information. <laughs> so the ones that we know about, the biggest cause for admission is uh, nests getting destroyed, it's baby birds. Nests being destroyed, bird napped fledglings, right, is really common. You know, if a bird has most of its feathers and it's hopping around, it's a fledgling, and you leave it there, right? Unless it's, if, if it's bleeding, you can take it to rehab. But if it's healthy hopping around, it's a fledgling, it's supposed to be doing that. They act really dumb. Um, but so we get a lot of bird nap fledglings, and then we get a lot of, yeah, nests being destroyed. Um, someone's dog grabs a nest of Carolina wrens uh, and scatters them everywhere, and the parents are not anywhere, you know, things like that. Uh, but then hit by car is, is a big one. Um, many birds are hit by cars, like Neo was hit by a car. Uh, we still get a lot of the uh, many bigger birds that are shot. We had a gunshot bald eagle come in this year, like an adult, full, you know, white head, white tail from Randolph County, West Virginia. Um, like, why? Ever, you knew what you were shooting, right, if you shot an adult bald eagle. Um, and it's a bird that's not going to go back to the wild that she has to go live at. She's, she's um, not releasable and we're going to live at the Louisville Zoo. So it's, it's depressing. But this, uh, this is a hard question to ask, but how are you dealing with the uh, uh, highly pathogenic H1N1? Um, yes. Because that's been an issue with rehabbers in Georgia. Yes. So they, they stopped taking Yes, some certain species, right? Yeah, so highly pathogenic avian influenza, which you may have, probably many of you have heard about it. It's, um, you know, killing a lot of waterfowl and birds that eat waterfowl and domestic fowl. So in California condors, there is this tragic recent story that about 20 California condors from that Arizona, Utah population have died from a highly pathogenic avian influenza. It's hard to say all of that. Um, so far, we have tested the birds that we think show symptoms or could possibly have symptoms of it. And so far, they've all tested negative. Uh, we haven't stopped admitting anything, but we're trying to be a little more careful with waterfowl that come in. But we don't get very many waterfowl anyway. So we, we, almost, we almost get no waterfowl. We just get it. No. We keep, well, we keep all the birds that come into the hospital quarantined anyway. So we kind of always do that, I guess. Uh, we don't put any birds with the other birds um, if we think they're going to die right away. Or if that sounds horrible, but you know what I mean? Like if they're, they come in the hospital before they go to where the volunteers take care of the rehab birds, we kind of keep them separate while they're sort of in intensive care, I guess. So when things move up to where the other birds are, they're healing, like if they're healing from head trauma or broken bone or something like that. But as far as I know, uh, well, if you, if you eat a, a bird, or something that had it, then you can contract it. Okay. Also, it's a lot of, it's, it's feces, I, as I understand it. Um, like if a bird flies, there are some places where, some zoos that brought all of their birds inside, so wild birds flying overhead wouldn't be okay. going to the bathroom on, um, into their enclosures and stuff like that. Uh, as far as I know, there have been no confirmed positive tests in the state of West Virginia. But certainly birds flying overhead have it. Um, but as far as I know, nothing that we've tested has come back positive. Um, so I don't know. We don't, we don't get many, water, many waterfowl at all. And we don't get many like black vultures and bald eagles. We, we maybe get one black vulture a year into rehab. And we usually don't get many bald eagles. We've had four this year already. None of them that have had anything like None of them that were sick, all that were trauma. So, yeah, let's let's go to bed. Great, Diane. Thank you. The birds. Yeah. He wants.
wanted to come back out, so. And, and if anyone wants coffee, we'll be around.